Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, and welcome to a, a Wednesday seminar day, and it's a very special one. Um, we're very happy to have some a number of people who have been invited to speak to us all on MT data acquisition. Well, where are we going, Kovadimus? And just for <laughs> just for a little humorous uh, picture, there on the left is uh, the MT system. I cut my teeth on back in uh, the early 70s, Rosemary Hutton here. Um, and that was, uh, as you can see, uh, a home-built uh, MT system. We've moved along a long way since then. So the for those of you that are new to the MNRs, if you go to the MT and the MNR page, you'll, you'll find links to prior MNRs, the YouTube link and the presentation, and also registration links for uh, upcoming webinar, MNRs. And a, a quick advertisement for next week's seminar. Um, at the same time, Hannah Peterson on a case study comparison of airborne EM data over two magmatic uh, nickel deposits. So today, like I say, we have this wonderful lineup of speakers who are going to talk to us about where are we going to go over the five-year, 10-year, possibly 20-year time frame in, in MT. Um, and the, the agreed running order uh, is first of all, we'll talk about instrumentation uh, and then talk about acquisition. Uh, in instrumentation, um, Phoenix Zong and Metronics have a joint presentation that will be given by Leo Fox. Uh, and then Lviv will talk, uh, uh, Vera will give us a presentation and then uh, Steve Constable on Ocean uh, MT. And then I invite people to ask a short Q&A at that time and please send them in um, in written uh, in written form. Um, then we're going to acquisition and, and two of the largest companies that, that collect thousands of MT data sites every year, uh, Quantac uh, and Nordwest. And Roger Sharp will be presenting for uh, Quantec and then Nick Palshin for Nordwest. And then we might have comments from the manufacturers because some of these, of course, are, are doing and have done acquisition. And then a Q&A on acquisition, written only, short questions. And then I'll open it up to everybody. And at this point, you can ask anything you like, or you can make a point. If you raise your hand, uh, we'll make it possible for you to uh, to interact verbally and put your video on if you want. Mm. And then have a wrap up, uh, one minute uh, per panelist. Um, it's wonderful. This this will be is being recorded and will be live. Will be on uh, in uh, in an hour or so. So I'll stop my share at this point and invite uh, Leo to share your screen and give us your presentation from the three companies. Uh, you're, you're muted, Leo. Yeah, I'm trying to find that uh, the little slider you're talking about. It's disappeared here. Hold uh, on. It was fine, actually. You okay? Yeah, it was good. All right. <clears throat> so go? Yep. All right. So uh, as usual with Alan, there's never a dull moment. It's been that late for about... Uh, 41 years since I first met Alan <laughs> in the field west of Toronto with our first gen MT system. So uh, I know where we've been in this Quo Vadimus vein, but uh, it's not that clear where we're going. And it's kind of a, a really interesting thing that uh, when Alan put up the idea of this seminar, you know, we had some discussions. I had a phone call from Scott and then uh, Bernhard got into the mix. And we found uh, in spite of, or maybe because of the intense competition that we've experienced among ourselves over the last 40 years, we actually share some pretty, some really important perspectives as manufacturers uh, because it hasn't been easy, it's, you know, it's a niche market and it's always a struggle to do everything you need to do. 
So we fairly early on decided on a joint presentation and thanks to Scott for the idea. And what we're gonna focus on here, uh, what, what we agreed is we, we're not going to do the, the sort of the commercial presentation, the chest thumping about the wonders of our specs and so on. I mean, anyone who's interested can contact us. We'll be happy to give you a demo or you can see stuff on our websites. Uh, we're obviously we're all working on things. Uh, we don't like to talk about things until we actually have them. Uh, we've learned that over the years. <laughs> okay. uh, but one of the biggest parts of our shared perspective relates to cost and uh, this idea that uh, MT is too expensive. So it's true that reducing the cost will expand the market somewhat. We certainly had a strong experience of that back in '97. Uh, when the GPS sync MT systems came out. But it's, it's not the only, and today not even the main factor. And then there's the comparison with seismic. So every time we went to the SEG, you know, we, the MT companies in our little humble booths, there we were among the seismic dinosaurs with the giant booths and the multi towers and, you know, so uh, we were always comparing ourselves against seismic and trying to figure out, well, how can we be like them? But eventually we learned we can't be like them. You know, we're different from them in many ways. And uh, we're in our niche. We're measuring something very different from them for very different reasons uh, with different constraints. So we can't be like them. Not, a, I mean, we're involved in exploration with MT, but that's, you know, there's some similarities, but there's more differences and similarities. And then the tech and the market trends. Yeah. You know, we so Leo, we, we, we're not seeing your slides. You're not seeing this? No, no, we're just seeing you talking, actually. Shit. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for, I thought you said it was okay. Are you all right now? Uh, uh... Now you have to press that. That's it. <laughs> Only summary. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Alan. You said it was okay. So uh, it was okay uh, before. It's, yeah. Anyway. Okay. So you know, breakthroughs. We all love breakthroughs, but they only happen once in a while and can't be predicted. So most of the increase and in, and in improvements are are these sort of down in the trenches, slogging with minor uh, but constant improvements. And the big thing for us uh, that we see lately is the decrease in MT for hydrocarbon exploration, which looks like it's going to continue to be less and less for hydrocarbon exploration. So let's go. Okay, so this uh, is one of my two pictures in the presentation. They say a picture is worth a thousand words and uh, numbers might be worth a thousand pictures. So... Um, this is the government's version of inflation over time. We all know it's probably much worse than that. So I picked 1980 because that happened to be the year that Phoenix got into MT. Um, so whatever MT cost in 1980, it would cost at least 3.62 times that today, everything else being equal, it was just inflation. But what happened? In fact, the real cost of equipment is about 10 times less now than it was in 1980. So these numbers are based on actual Phoenix, they're Phoenix numbers. They've been exposed to Bernhard and to, uh, to Scott and they agree with them. I mean, their numbers are a little different, but the trend is definitely the same. So uh, I, re I remember selling the, the first gen Phoenix MT system back in 81. It, it was built in 1980-81, and it cost about 350 or even 400 k. But a big chunk of that was Hewlett Packard equipment. You know, the, there were no PCs in those days. There were microprocessors, but in order to run that system, there was some trick used in the 9845, and then you had to have a function generator, spectrum analyzer. So to make a long story short, it was about 35 k per channel. But today, a system that sells for 50 k, you could say, well, that's 10k per channel and if you do the math down at the bottom the difference is about 12.7 times so let's just call it 10 times you can look at it from the point of view of survey price and when you do look at 
you know, the numbers. I remember this is an actual number. We sold MT sites for 3,500 bucks uh, to Alan <laughs> in the Lithopro project. And uh, sometimes it was even more than that in Japan. So 3,500 bucks in 1980, but uh, something like $1,500 today, uh, sort of a routine site. I don't no, not a really challenging one with terrible logistics, but about 1,500 bucks, maybe 2K per site. So you can, the numbers are not exact, but the trend is clear. So, you know, seven, eight, nine times less. So how did that happen? Because everything else has gone up, fuel, vehicles, everything has gone up, especially things related to people. So there has to be a decrease due to increased efficiency, uh, be, which comes from the equipment and the software. So that's what I think. I think that the, the capability increase explains most of the cost decrease and the, to a smaller degree, an increase in the size of the market. So cost, capability. So, you know, what capability? Well, you could, there's hundreds of different technical uh, factors, but for sure the equipment, we just saw Alan's picture of his, of Rosemary's system that back in, I don't know, the seventies, I guess. So that was what a system looked like then. You know, I had a slide that showed all the equipment we used to have to have, including a Honda generator and so forth. So there's been a very big decrease in the power consumption, and that means much smaller field crews to haul everything around. And then when we went to GPS link, for example, you got rid of a lot of the cables. And at the same time, everything else is improved, expanded, increased, like bandwidth, memory size. The first gen system from Phoenix had a, a mass of 10 megabytes of disk memory. You know, channel count's gone up, processors are hundreds of times faster. You know, 1D inversion became 2D, and now there's real 3D inversions at a reasonable price. Uh, and the last example was suggested by Scott. He said, you know, just for example, the wideband sensor, like the one uh, pioneered by Matronix with the split AMT MT that having a wideband sensor, whether it's uh, sequential or simultaneous, allows you to have your magnetic sensor count. Now let's talk about cost again. Okay, so in the oil industry, they like to throw around this acronym they call CAPEX. So this is the capital cost of equipment. It's basically the amortization. How do you amortize your equipment? Okay, so it's pretty simple. If a system, let's just say a system costs 40K, I think we said 50K, but it doesn't matter whether it's 40K or 50K. And these are, I think these are conservative assumptions here. Um, let's say the lifespan of the equipment is 10 years. We all know it can be much longer than that. Let's say the system does 40 stations per year for 10 years, and in its lifetime, it does 400 stations. So I think uh, this is probably conservative. Probably the real figure is at least double that, but let's go with this. Uh, and then we can say, okay, then the amortization or the capital expense per station is that 40K divided by the 400 stations, 100 bucks. If, if you get more stations and over more years, then the figure is less than that. And then you can compare your capital expense to other things. You can say, well, okay, if the if the price of a site today is fifteen hundred bucks, then that hundred bucks is about six percent of the price. So, what would happen if you dropped the price of equipment to zero? You know, aside from the fact that the equipment companies would disappear and there'd be nobody to service your stuff like GDD now. Okay, the acquisition price could drop by the 6%, but, but we all know the operating expense. Uh, you know, we had a lot of talk about this with Scott because Scott's company does more surveys than we do, but the operating expense can sometimes can be enormous. I remember giving a talk in Australia about five years ago and uh, I was guesstimating how much the Auslamp station costs and Graham Heinsohn said, oh, it's $10,000 per station just for the helicopters. <laughs> 
I said, okay, you know. So the normally it's not that much, but we all know, you know, vehicles, crew salaries, hotels, all of this stuff is is costly. And then on top of that, you have this new category of expense. After you've got all your data, now it has to be processed and interpreted. And often a client needs a consultant to advise them. So these costs are not trivial, you know. I mean, I I wouldn't be a consultant in this field for less than this number you see down here for fifteen hundred bucks a day. Not that anybody would pay me fifteen hundred bucks a day because I don't know enough about the uh, inversions and so on. <laughs> reprocessing, there's quite a business in reprocessing, and it's you know fifty to hundred bucks a site. And then there's the three D inversions. So uh, as Scott pointed out. He said he had just done a survey and then these other things that were added on were equal to the acquisition cost. So they're not trivial. So, you know, the when you start looking at this bigger picture, you see the equipment cost is a small piece of the pie. And uh, Bernhard gave this example here, what you call the hidden cost. In order to have a company that builds this stuff you know, designs it, builds it, maintains an inventory, and then runs around the world selling it uh, in the shadow of the seismic companies and so on. <laughs> There's a lot of hidden costs. So I just put, this is verbatim from uh, Bernhard. You can read it, but I mean, it's obvious, you know, there's warranties and uh, you got to design the future thing and the mission, you know, it's it just goes on and on and on. Uh, yeah, the redesigns and so forth, and on and on. <laughs> so as Bernd has said, the operational costs are the dominating factor, 90 to 95% over the lifetime. So uh, this is Bernhard, where we're competing in a free market, you get better equipment at that price, you're free to enter the market, okay. This is for me, okay. So what I said is, uh, to be realistic, if 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 there's going to be somebody supplying MT equipment to the world market, it pretty much has to be a corporate vehicle. It can't be a research institute or a university because their their mandate is different. They're not set up to handle the the things that Bernhard just mentioned in the previous slide, or warranty, or you know, constant support for software as operating systems change and so forth. But a company has to do all of that. You know, we have rent. Our rent is about $200,000 a year and just went up by 60% to about $200,000 a year. Just like that, 60% increase in our rent. And then you have to have an inventory. If you rely on just-in-time procurement anymore, you're dead. And you can't do anything without staff and staff costs more all the time. And then you have to have your accountants and then you have to travel around the world less now thanks to Zoom, the ongoing tech support, and then always the struggle to get good data under challenging conditions. So for sure, a university or an institute could make a system for less, but could they really provide the other necessary, the support and, and the, the, the sort of envelope of necessities that surrounds manufacturing? And nobody can do this at a loss. Okay, and then there's the ongoing comparison with seismic. So as I said, you know, the people in the MT business, we are constantly comparing ourselves to seismic when you go to trade shows, because seismic was, you know, at least 10 to 100 times bigger than MT in terms of oil and gas exploration expenditure. But the problem is it's, it's appealing, and we all know that seismic stuff caught, you know, this magic 1,000 or 1,500 bucks a channel but how would you get there? The problem is that the seismic demand is orders of magnitude, maybe 10, at least maybe more like 100 or 1,000 times per year, even though it's decreasing now. And oil companies have subsidized some of these developments. I know about the wireless seismic one. Uh, if you have questions about stride, you'd have to ask Scott because that example comes from him. But I remember wireless seismic got something like $17 million from Chesapeake. So uh, I've never seen 
I've never seen any support like that for AMT. You might get an order for, you know, a few hundred thousand bucks from somebody, but that's it. And then there's the bandwidth, you know, about two decades in seismic. And uh, we're to, we are to measure eight decades, 10K to 10K. The seismic sensor is that geophone. Cost maybe 100, 200 bucks, but we have to measure five components. So the electric field part is relatively simple and, and uh, low cost. Uh, you know, now you can do it with the carbon electrode that Nordwest uh, came out with, which is pretty good. So, no, you know, we want to get out of lead too. That's one of those great incremental improvements. But the mag sensors, you know, they, they're much more complex and have much more material and wire and cores and everything in them. So you can't, unless there's some magic new development that uh, Valeria is going to tell us about, you know, you're kind of stuck building an induction sensor the way you build an induction sensor. And then there's uh, what kind of imagery does the technique offer up to the, the, the final consumer, which is an oil company interested in, you know, targeting a well which costs millions of dollars based on the imagery so we all know seismic resolution is very different than uh, mt resolution you're talking about propagation versus diffusion and so forth so there's lots of reasons why mt could never replace seismic it never will it never we tried for years uh, we we found our niche but we can never replace seismic and even if it, even if MT were free, that doesn't mean people would use it because it, the utility of MT in exploration is, you know, what image does it offer up to the people who want to drill a hole? So in, in the mining part, I, I'm only talking about oil here. In mining, we're, we're, I think we have an advantage because we're looking for conductors and seismic has a hard time seeing them. It's, it's almost like the opposite case that where seismic is trying to get into mining exploration. There we have the advantage, but in oil and gas exploration, seismic has the advantage. And then we come to the theme here. Well, you know, the trends. So what's going on? Where are we going? So if you remember the capability increase over time, I think this for sure is going to be continue. There's modest but constant increments in, in capability and decreases in cost and so forth. Um, they're obvious, you know, the power consumption goes down, the memory gets cheaper, the processes get faster, the ADCs have more bits, the processing gets more and more sophisticated. You know, now we can do networking and Starlink and get data out of the field to anywhere and so forth. Uh, Bernhard, I think, offered the airborne or semi-airborne EM. So we're, you know, we're all thinking about, hmm, what can we do with drones? And I don't know. Uh, we'll find out. Uh, the market trends. I mentioned uh, we clearly see this reduction in MT for hydrocarbon exploration, and you, you may or may not believe it, but I, it looks like the end of fossil fuels is rapidly approaching. Even if you just look at what they're doing with the renewable energy in China, you know, <laughs> their oil consumption will drop in about 10 years to almost nothing. And mining exploration, it's increasing. It's been going up ever since the 90s. So this continuous few percent a year of incremental increase is, I think this is the key. You can't count on the breakthroughs, but you, you can count on these modest but and continuous increments in capability. And uh, if we, rather than give a prediction, um, let's quote somebody we all recognize as uh, somebody who knows what he's talking about with predictions in science. And if he mm -hmm. says it's difficult, then I think we have to agree with him. As I said, we're all working on stuff. We all have our own visions of where we might go to reduce costs, make sensors smaller, replace lead electrodes with carbon and so on. But you can talk to us about that separately, or you'll hear it from the other guys. So that's it. If you want, uh, if you want to uh, dig into the equipment that the three of us offer, there are the hot links. Uh, and uh, thanks again to Bernhard and Scott for patiently reviewing this and making suggestions. It was quite an exercise. Thank you, Alan.
as I said to Bernard, whoever would have thought that we were ever going to sit down and give a joint presentation, but we did. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, when the technical questions come, uh, I'm going to, uh, I'll hand off to Jan. Jan will answer the technical questions. So thank you guys for listening and thank you for taking the great risk of letting me do the talking. It's a dangerous <laughs> decision. <laughs> yeah, thank, thanks, Leo. Um, we'll, we'll hold the questions until we've heard the other two speakers in the uh, instrumentation uh, segment. So can we move on to uh, um, the Lviv group? So if you want to stop your share, Leo, please. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then um, Vera, are you ready to share? Ah, okay, great. Good to go. But you're muted, I think. At least I can't hear anything. Yeah. Yeah, you, uh, Vera, you're muted. Thank you. Are there? Good. Now, now it's good. Now it's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I want to pre present uh, how we look uh, our way in future uh, in a sense of development, maybe not uh, so common as uh, Leo done, uh, not about pricing, but uh, uh, how we look uh, Lviv way in sense of development. Uh, Let's start from a long period uh, uh, sensor for long period magnetotelluric and for, as we see, for shallow depths, uh, present state of sensor is satisfactory. The noise level mostly we think okay, and um, thermal drift can be digitally compensated. But for deep and super deep sounding for long term deployment, uh, sensor tilt and temporal uh, drift influencing necessary to be reduced. Uh, on this way, uh, for long-term installation in field to eliminate the tilt effect, uh, the efficient way may be use of suspended uh, flux gate sensor. Uh, here is our suspended sensor and parameters of old development and new development. Also, you can see on the left the noise level of uh, some components and uh, uh, instrument in red dots uh, noise. And uh, bottom plot presents very long term time drift, which is about uh, 0 0.5 nanotesla per year in observatory condition. For audio magnetotelluric, for quiet environment, the sensitivity threshold of available sensor practically close to theoretically possible level. Uh, but um, mm, more and more territories uh, polluted by the mains frequency due to urbanization. And we need to look for a quiet place. The sensor will not be saturated or we have to do special means uh, to compensate the main signal in the body of sensor. And uh, in uh, this way, uh, how we propose to solve this pre uh, problem. Uh, the attenuation of main signal in the sensor volume for induction coils more than 60 dB and for flux gate, uh, we use the digital filtration. Both of these sensor uh, can work even close to power lines. 
the main disadvantage of this um, method is that the upper frequency range of such combination cannot be more than 40 hertz. And for uh, broadband for high frequency, uh, here is a proposed combination of sensors, one from uh, for less frequency and for higher frequency. For this combination, the data logger uh, for the moment is under development. Uh, so uh, as uh, what, uh, how we see, uh, the major improvements uh, are not uh, expected. Only maybe some parameters can be improved. A significant uh, breakthrough in the new future might only occur if new physical principle for measurement the magnetic field appear. And uh, uh, we ask our users, uh, to explain us the, uh, whether they need more improvements and which ones. And uh, it would be good uh, opinion of our users what additional sensor or service uh, they expected from us about data transfer, networking, access to data, and etc. Thank you. Alan. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much, Vera. Um, let's move on now to, uh, to Steve. Okay, here we go. Um, getting to talk after Leo was the sh sh short straw there, Alan. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, a brief history of marine MT data collection it started in 1965 when Chip Cox and John Few deployed the first um, electric and magnetic field recorders and made, made, made what became the first MMT uh, response. Um, in 76, Mobile attempted one site in the Gulf of Mexico in 20 meters of water, but it was using land acquisition gear on a boat. And the gear was uh, similar to the stuff that Alan showed. Um, but in the 80s, um, across the world, a group of people uh, started collecting marine MT using ring core flux gates, although Jean Fu was still using his torsion fiber magnetometers. Um, and in 1994, because of interest in industry in extending MT offshore on the continental shelves, I tested the use of coils on the current Scripps controlled source electric field receiver. Um, and then was able to create an industry consortium that funded the development of a, a new instrument, uh, which eventually became a 24-bit instrument. And by renting these instruments out to uh, Arnold Orange Associates, I was able to sort of build up a small fleet of instruments. Um, and then when uh, controlled source EM became a thing in industry, Exxon Mobil funded the development of a Mark III instrument, uh, still using a 24-bit A to D converter. And I started making my own co coils using aluminum wire to save weight uh, and continued to build up the instrument fleet through renting to industry. Um, and then early in the 2000s, um, AGO and EMGS started collecting commercial MT for the oil, mainly for the oil industry. Um, in 2004, Schlumberger bought AGO. Um, and then around 2012, went out of the business of doing Marine EM. And I was eventually able to convince them to donate their equipment to Scripps. Um, so this is the Scripps instrument. Um, it, um, it, in deep water, it can collect MT data down to about 10 seconds period, but in shallow water, um, you can go up to 100 hertz. Um, 
you know, in, in some ways, we were immediately um, implementing the innovations that uh, Leo talked about. Um, so we've always used loggers. We've always had very low power consumption. The Scripps instrument is less than 500 milliwatts, and that includes the data logging, the timing, and the sensors. Um, and um, thanks to um, the support from industry and the donation from Schlumberger, we've got a fleet of about 150 seafloor receivers. Um, they use a mixture of commercial and homebrew acoustic systems for navigation and release. Um, and we've built a custom stray line buoy that uh, gives you GPS location when the thing surfaces and allows for efficient recoveries. So we can deploy about 24 of these in a day and recover about 12 a day in, in deep water. Um, I, you know, a logger is a logger is a logger. It's really easy to put seismic sensors on the MT instruments. And I've done that on a number of occasions with three different types of seismic sensors. And I think going forward, the joint acquisition of seismics and MT is going to be a, a thing of the future, certainly in the marine environment. Um, five minutes is too short to explain all the applications of uh, marine MT, plate tectonics, mining, geothermal, groundwater. Um, this is a recent example from um, New Zealand. Um, it was for volcanic hazard um, and we deployed and recovered 73 sites. Well, we only lost two channels due to failed sensors and cables. And the total ship time was only about seven days. And as you can see, one of the vessels we used was, was, was quite small. Um, we've, we've become a sort of de facto instrument facility for the National Science Foundation. Um, the, um, the NSF is funding about one or two fairly major projects per year. Um, you'll notice that I'm, 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 I'm only a PI on um, a little more than half of all these proposals. I'm happy to make the equipment available and the technicians available to anybody who wants to write a proposal. Um, and uh, I guess if you, if you add all this up, if the proposals are about 500,000 each, um, you're looking at, uh, you know, five to $10 million worth of uh, work here. So in conclusion, um, we've been able to build up a large fleet with industry support. It's worth about $20 million, depending on how you count it. It's functionally state-of-the-art. There's nothing I would do to this instrument to improve it. Um, I've looked carefully at data with 16-bit and 24-bit acquisition, and I can't really tell the difference. And so I don't think there's any need for 32 bits in our world, at least. The noise floor of the instrument is probably determined by the environment rather than the sensors. Um, and because we've, uh, we, we're, because because of the Schlumberger donation, we've been able to. Um, sort of support expansion and replace losses by, by refurbishing the old Schlumberger instruments as we need them. Um, but we can't build any more of these and there are some groups that would like to buy them and I would be happy to sell them if they, uh, if they wanted to do that. Um, but the flashcards, CPUs and ADD converters that I use are all, all obsolete. And it's important to note that the two technicians and two engineers working in my lab have between them over a hundred years of experience using these marine systems and those. So they're a critical part of the, the infrastructure. Um, so, you know, there are some um, um, re-engineering challenges going forward. It's worth noting that most of the cost, uh, you know, Leo made a compelling case that the cost of the instrument really is not important in the cost of the acquisition. Uh, in my case, the cost of the instrument is, 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 is not the electronics, it's the, um, high pressure is the machining of the high pressure cases, the, uh, the, the machining of the frames, the, um, the buoyancy elements and the acoustic, commercial acoustic units that we buy. So the actual, uh, the actual pointy end of the MT business is, is a small fraction of the, the total cost. Um, so that's it. Um, I think I stuck to my five minutes. Yeah, well done, Steve. It's fabulous how, how that, 
well, that's grown over over the last uh, years. You, you've done a tremendous job of, of really growing Marine uh, EM, Marine MT. So at this point, uh, I'd like to um, I'd like to ask people if they've got shortish uh, questions. I'd like to ask the instrument providers. Um, we'll we'll have a longer Q and A towards the end, uh, but. Uh, the uh, Patricia de la Gao threw some questions in, well, no comments really. <laughs> Talking about lifespan of equipment is longer than ten years, Leo. Uh, we don't, we shouldn't replace seismics. We help imaging, and then before you drill, you need to get through some geological hurdles that seismics may not be able to address. So, good comments, uh, Patricia. Uh, any questions? From Maybe while people are typing, I can have a short question slash sure. comment. I, I'm I'm curious: Are these complaints about costs that you mentioned, Leo, um, from the commercial providers? Because I would think for them, it's clear that this is the calculation, right? And it's as you say, a few percent. I mean, for us in the academic game, of course, the calculation goes quite differently because our instruments spend a lot more time on shelves. And often, uh, sort of people costs are, are thought of quite differently uh, than instrument acquisition costs. Yes, if I have to ask somebody to give me two hundred thousand for instruments, yes, uh, that's a hard task. Uh, I can go to a science foundation and get two hundred thousand to to pay for like a person for three years. So, um, where do those those comments mostly come from, or somebody else? Uh, do you want me to answer that, Jan? Yeah, go ahead, you. Yeah, okay. So, uh, well, it, it comes from different people at different times. I certainly remember one sphincter clenching moment back in, uh, I think, early 1996, when our biggest customer in China visited us and uh, over at Christmas. And they, uh, they hung around through New Year because they don't really celebrate those things themselves. And they came to see us in early January of uh, 96, I guess it was. And they said, well, you know, we like your equipment and we've done a lot of MT with that in China, but, uh, you know, it's, it's too expensive and too hard to use and too heavy and everything. So uh, why don't you go away and invent something new and come back to us? <laughs> so, so in that case, it was clearly from a customer. Um, and uh, of course, Alan has mentioned this a few times. I mean, I think it's more in the sense, you know, let's have a vision of where we could get to. You have to put up a goal post. If you're not striving for something, you'll never get there, right? So uh, yes, we we do strive to reduce cost, but you know, I, I and I appreciate that from the point of view of the academic, the equipment cost is a much bigger deal than it is for, uh, uh, say, a mining company or an oil company. They don't really care. They care about site cost and, uh, you know, how you how you handle the equipment cost is your problem or the contractor's problem. So I think that the idea that the equipment cost is too high, I think this looms. It's when it comes from academic. Or, or the the research side people, it's because they see it a different way. They have other costs that are, are covered that they don't have to worry about. As you said, you know, the salaries, the infrastructure and so on. So for a, a university prof who wants to buy the equipment, it's a big deal to go and get a budget to buy the equipment. So I think the, it depends on your point of view, right? I, I don't think I've ever had, uh, hardly ever you hear from people and from clients, mining companies and oil companies that the equipment is is too expensive. They look at the, the cost per station and how many, you know, what area you can cover for what cost and what do you get out of it and so on. So is that, a, is that an answer? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I jump it, in, but we, we we can't we can't make this just uh, instrument side. I think we we got to move on to uh, we can get come back to this. Maybe uh, maybe uh, Alan, let me do a small comment. Um, a system maybe consists of three thousand parts, and they have all a different delivery time. 
Today we have delivery times of 40 weeks and 50 weeks. So I have to order parts at least one year in advance. And that means uh, we have uh, one person at our factory uh, just uh, hunting uh, parts for the future. And uh, th that is a uh, labor cost, let's say uh, $60,000 uh, a year for a person uh, trying to acquire the parts, which should be there when I start to manufacture the instrument. And the overhead is that I have to make a planning already for 2024 end, right? And that means uh, I have one person just for doing this. Right? You don't go to the supermarket and, and buy some eggs, some milk, some, some flavor, and then you, you make a cake. So that is, that is these, these are tremendous costs. Then the other cost is if I ship an instrument to China or to some countries where I need a export license, yeah? it's, it's, a, it's a process for several weeks working on documentation, for getting a license for the, the coils, for example. No? And uh, all these costs uh, are inside the, uh, the, the, the sales price. No? And uh, this is what I call the hidden cost. The same is if, if some manufacturer says, I don't uh, uh, supply you with this amplifier anymore. So then you look for something which is pin compatible, but needs to draw the same current, et cetera, et cetera. And then you make a redesign, then you test it, the engineer builds a new board, which should be fit into the old systems because we want to guarantee that the system is running for more than 10 years. And then you have, let's say, typically qualification of a new board with some parts change. It cost me, let's say $10,000. And these, all these costs uh, are adding, and uh, this is a conflict between Ellen and us, for sure. If we would sell uh, 20 times more systems, these uh, uh, costs for acquisition of the parts or for making licenses and qualification, ISO and so on, would for sure drop down. Right? But uh, at the moment, I don't know, uh, we don't have these big numbers. And that means I have an overhead, let's say three, four, three thousand dollars for just paperwork no? for one system. Yeah, I, 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 I won't prolong this because I want to get going on the acquisition side. Um, but I, I will say I'm happy to pay Leo uh, ten dollars every time I record a sign. <laughs> uh, I can't afford four hundred thousand dollars to buy the systems. <laughs> Okay, Let, let's, move, let's move on now to acquisition. And uh, Roger, if you would like to make your presentation available. Uh, all right. Is that the right one? Yeah, it's good. All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, I got a little bit uh, about uh, uh, the first little bit of reducing cost of equipment from a contractor's point of view. So everything I'm going to say is from a contractor's point of view. Uh, and uh, honestly, I don't have a, a problem with the initial cost of instruments so much. Uh, one thing that wasn't in uh, in uh, Leo's uh, CapEx uh, argument was uh, maintenance. Uh, for us, maintenance is by far the biggest cost. Uh, and as contractors, we use our gear really hard. Um, a lot harder than uh, than uh, 40 stations in 10 years, that's for sure. And uh, uh, the gear needs a lot of maintenance. Uh, and that's that's really where the cost comes. And that's where the reliability and the new instruments. And it, it speaks to Bernard's uh, comment, too, that uh, trying to maintain gear that's, uh, you know, 10 years old, even five years old, even two years old, sometimes uh, the supply chain issues are pretty crazy. Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, just finding parts that fit into those instruments is pretty difficult. Um, so anyway, from our from our point of view here, the uh, broadband sensors are a great thing uh, in terms of initial cost uh, and in terms of carrying the the, the gear around. Uh, broadband sensors are wonderful, um, and I really thank um, Metronics, Phoenix, um, you know, the people that have really driven uh, broadband sensor development, uh, it, it's, uh, it's made a huge difference in our contracting business. Uh, we have a little development too on the electrode side, uh, plate electrodes. Uh, they're considerably cheaper than pot electrodes. Leo mentioned getting out of lead, uh, which by which he meant uh, pots. Um, plates are steel uh, and, uh, and they're, uh, they're lighter. 
uh, they last longer uh, and, uh, uh, and we found them very effective. Uh, I've got a couple of slides that'll show the uh, capabilities uh, next, uh, later. Um, uh, the active plates, um, you know, in terms of new developments and things like that, the active plates aren't really so much new, but uh, um, we've had a lot of uh, a lot of experiments with them. Uh, same with some capacitive electrodes. Uh, where it's all going, I, I, uh, it'd be nice if capacitive electrodes and, and active plates could could come together because the capacitive electrodes do a good job at high frequencies but not low. The active plates. Um, don't do such a good job at high frequencies. Uh, and so uh, merging those would be wonderful. Uh, battery technology, everybody's familiar with uh, how fast things are changing in the battery world due to uh, electric vehicles. Um, and so uh, we're capitalizing on that, uh, mainly with uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries. Uh, uh, the next thing is about loggers themselves. For us, uh, we do a, a multi-physics uh, type of survey uh, that has IP, DZ resistivity, and MT. That's what we like. That's what we offer to the mining business, and it uh, it works very well for the mining business. Uh, and uh, the problem with that is that the loggers need to be more capable than a dedicated MT logger. Um, so, uh, and then I've just got a list of Things here that we can we could read through, but I think I, I need to skip ahead. Uh, it, it, it's it's uh, there's big differences between the dedicated MT logger and the sort of loggers that uh, that we like to use that um, have uh, can do things like hook up all the channels to electric uh, electrics. Uh, how do I get to the next page? Oh. Um, so. Uh, rapid accurate uh, deployment of MT sensors. So um, for us, it's all about deployment and getting the gear out there. Um, and so, uh, and getting it accurately out there. Uh, so the dream three component sensors, um, three component sensors are, uh, or, are de facto orthogonal. Uh, and so they're easier to align, even if you don't get them lined up, they're orthogonal. Uh, and you can make corrections. Uh, it's, it would be a huge dream come true if we could have three component sensors um, that aren't just flux gates um, for the low frequencies, but actually work for the high frequencies too. Um, so that's a, that's a little bit of a wish list. Uh, dual antenna GPSs, I don't know if you guys have heard of uh, uh, the uh, uh, Debbie site, uh, but uh, uh, we, we developed something similar, Q-Align. Uh, you have basically two to uh, GPS antennas uh, and on a little uh, handheld device. Uh, and this gives you uh, good uh, orientation on your coil. Uh, it also helps with navigation and get uh, positional accuracy. Um, honestly, we don't use it that much because it's based on GPS. Uh, and uh, GPS has big limitations in topo uh, and in vegetation. Uh, but it's a dream to have something like this, where we could just take it out there, uh, get to our, our electrode positions within a meter, uh, and boom, there you are, you know you're there, uh, and, uh, and to align your coils. Uh, that would be really, really helpful. So something about positioning. Drones, uh, I'm just going to skip that. Um, the uh, uh, fewer... Uh, uh, so for us... Uh, Reducing the, the, the uh, amount of alignment we have to do by using fewer coils per electrics. Um, that's, uh, that's, a, that's something that we've done from the beginning with uh, a Titan, uh, and it, uh, it, does, it does reduce costs. Uh, let's see. Uh, the market, um, as Leo said, uh, energy uh, is, is, uh, is dropping off. Uh, it's typically very grand scale, but um, you require a lot of special collaboration to get on those projects. You have helicopters, you have uh, health and safety, you have all kinds of demands um, that are uh, very difficult to meet without a collaborator and somebody used to working for those groups. Uh, geothermal mapping comes and goes. Uh, mineral exploration is the big one. Huge uptake. Um, depth scale, array development, those kind of things uh, are really important for mineral exploration. Uh, and of course, the multi-physics. So uh, next generation gear for us, uh, looking at larger, denser uh, site numbers, that addresses the mineral exploration challenge of needing 
good uh, high uh, near surface resolution, but at the same time wanting that extra depth of investigation that you get with MT. Um, frequency range, uh, 10 kilohertz to 10 seconds. Uh, but the thing is, we're almost always gonna um, acquire overnight anyway, uh, because to get 10 kilohertz, you need to go through the high frequency dead band. To get 10 seconds, you need to go through the low frequency uh, dead band. Uh, and those are much better addressed overnight. So you're gonna leave your gear out overnight. That's where the quality data comes from. Uh, and so, um, uh, it doesn't, you know, this this sort of band here, even though we can spec it, um, it doesn't matter this much, at, at that much at this stage, because, because you're going to have to leave your gear out. Um, so here's a, the promised slide on plates. Uh, we've got some pictures of porous pots, older porous pots, newer porous pots from Phoenix. Though, I mean, when we need lead chloride pots, um, those, are, those are the ones we use. Uh, rods, horrible, um, except for the very highest frequency. But here's our plates. Um, so our plates are special steel stabilized um, with uh, by rusting. We want them to be rusty. We want them to look ratty like this. You can see some of the moisture trapped underneath these, uh, these uh, plates. Uh, and this is how they start out installed just like a pot uh, in, a, in a mud pot patty. Uh, and so here, uh, here's, you know, 10 to the minus four to 10 to the four. Uh, and you've got uh, pots on the top, plates on the bottom. You've got a little bit of dead band issue here, but it's the same. That's the high frequency dead band, low frequency dead band. We just blow right through it because it's overnight here. Uh, and uh, you can see that there's minor, if any differences, all the way down to 10,000 seconds. Um, and so in our experience, it's like 100 seconds to to it, not 10,000 seconds, 100 seconds to 1,000 seconds. Um, we can, the plates will, the plates will, will work just fine, uh, except in that very, very lowest uh, frequency. So, um, so uh, we're pretty happy with the plates and it makes a big improvement on cost uh, and, uh, and uh, deployability. So, uh, and it's all about electrics. For us, it's all about electrics. For mining, it's all about electrics. So here's uh, a comparison. The next slide will show the comparison of acquiring uh, Spartan sites. Uh, these are on 200 meter sensors with uh, full tensor deployment that the, the, that the black indicates the electrodes or the dipoles uh, and, the, uh, and uh, the red indicates the coils with the vertical here. Uh, Titan has always been done in an EMAP type of way with uh, one or two sets of coils on the line. Uh, and then uh, and then a bunch of cross-line electrics. What we're experimenting with now is even more cross-line electrics. Uh, and so the result of that um, is uh, here's your Spartan sites uh, in a stitched 1D sense. Uh, here's your Titan standard. Uh, so you, uh, and the dashed line here is about 500 meters. So what we're doing is we're improving the, 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 the shallow resolution. Uh, for the MT biz, or for the uh, mining business. We're not worrying too much about the deep resolution. It's nice to have that. We want that. They want, everybody wants that to visualize their plumbing. They want to know what's down there. Uh, but the, the shallow part has to be right and accurate and high resolution. And so with the Titan Plus, by adding those extra EYs, we're getting even more uh, shallow resolution. Uh, and I'd just like to do a shout out to RTX for, uh, for cooperating and collaborating with us on that. Um, oh, and that's it. I've got a few more slides, but uh, I think my five minutes are up. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah, th thank you, Roger. Absolutely excellent points that, that you made. Um, can we um, move on now to uh, Nordwest? And Nick, if you want to stop sharing your screen, Roger, and let Nick come in. Uh, yeah, I stopped it, I think. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, you want to share your screen, Nick? Yeah, I'm ready, but it's still uh, still busy. <laughs> I mean, the share. Roger is still sharing his screen. Yeah, Roger, you have to stop sharing. Uh, I think I have. <laughs> um, let me. Uh, 
a ver, a ver. Ok. Nick. Yep. So, uh, this, this will be really a view from a geophysical service company. And uh, uh, Northwest is not only doing surveying, but also we are producing uh, instrumentation for the CIP at MT. Uh, as well as software, uh, but uh, of course uh, it will be a view from industry. So uh, here, it's it was done completely independently. So, but this part of my talk will completely support Leo's estimation. This is an example from Maybe. three different. Sorry. Yep, I can't see your slides. Oi, sorry. Let me do it again. Yeah, now I can see you need to still need to go full screen, but I can. Yeah. Is it Excellent. okay now? Yeah, yeah. that's good. Yeah, good. Uh, so uh, it was done completely independent, but this part of my talk uh, will completely uh, support Leo's estimations. So here I try to estimate the share of geophysical and non-geophysical cost in three projects. Uh, two projects from Bolivia and one project from Russia. All projects uh, uses ultra wide band MT technology, which is now, let us say, some industrial standard. Uh, and you can see that uh, the acquisition itself is only few part of costs. Uh, in Russian project, it's a little bit greater because they are not so strict requirement to uh, base camp, uh, AHS, etc. But a uh, share of this repetition of the instruments, uh, which is not less than 30% in general, uh, showing that really the cost of the instrument in commercial MT survey is small, really small. So it's few percent. Um, largest share was in this big Russian project is about 14%. So here are some conclusions, just supporting Leo's uh, point of view or not point of view, his results. The share of instrument cost in commercial MT survey is very small. The cost of instrumentation is mostly the price of entrance ticket. And if we want to reduce the cost of commercial OMT study, we need to reduce non-geophysical costs or other words to increase productivity. Here I'd like to add that uh, according to our experience, uh, the instruments are used about 150 days per year and the average service life in 10 years. This is average figures for the last maybe uh, 10 years. So how can we increase productivity? The first, uh, is to reduce number of remeasured sites. So for many reasons where to remeasure the sites, bad data, damaged cables, etc. So we need on-site quality control and especially before and after acquisition. Then we could increase the number of instruments which could be reinstalled during working day. So we need easy and fast MP instrument installation at the table. Then during the large projects, especially in tough environments, environment, we always need to repair cables, sometimes instruments, so we need fast and cheap shipping of instruments and spare part to survey area, and sometimes flexibility in updating firmware. And of course, modern software, uh, which enable us to give on-site time quality control and to process big amount of data, because sometimes we need to process dozens of uh, sites per day. Here comes requirements. One bottom robust system, I mean data logger. Compact, low consuming, high dynamic range, accurate fast positioning, online real-time control and data download, flexible acquisition time, the possibility for scheduled start, uh, scheduled start or stop. And I would like a little bit stress about automatic transfer function correction for poor grounding and high frequencies. Uh, concerning sensors, 
according to our experience, it's better to have and better to have it in future different types of sensors. One for mineral exploration, say high frequency AMT and ultra wideband for deep water for hydrocarbon prospecting. Of course, we need lower noise at all frequency. Cables and connectors is very important. Water, dust, mud, foolproof. Uh, reliability and maintainability. Low cost electrodes, environmental friendly. Now we use graphite and planning to use it. This is very reliable, easy to store, transport, import, export, small size, easy to install and cheap. You can just throw it away very easily. Uh, this is an example of how poor grounding is affecting our data. So it's reducing signal to noise ratio. It is distortion of impedance and high frequency. This is an example on one site in Siberia. In spring, it was covered by ice. We have high resistance and we have distortions to this, uh, this orange data. And uh, later we revisited this site in summer when everything was in water, it was more or less good uh, resistance. It seems like Nick is having said we get reliable data. No. What happened? You had an internet problem. Maybe you want to just repeat the last 30 seconds of what you said. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, um, this is an example of how poor electric grounding is affecting the uh, empty results. This is one site in Eastern Siberia and we measured data twice in spring when it was ice covered and high resistance grounding resistance and then in summer with a normal grounding resistance and you see that effect is significant uh, so there are two ways to deal with it the first is to use hybrid lines so one line is ungrounded so this combined uh, capacity and normal line but this way of grounding or say using is uh, have mm, uh, much more effort to install the line, so more time, it's uh, not very comfortable. And uh, the most effective scheme now is to correct transfer function. But in this case, we need to know distributed capacity of line. We need to know the resistance of electrodes, and this could be measured by the instrument. And also we should know input resistance or impedance of the instrument and input capacity of the instrument, which is important. In this case, we can store this data in our together with time series and later during processing, make this correction. So this is the way which is, uh, seems to be more effective at the moment. And finally, a few remarks about the future. Unfortunately, it depends on the market. It looks like it was mentioned before that uh, most likely mineral exploration and monitoring is our future. And we should move to array acquisition, which will replace profile wine, but it depends on clients. New instrumentation will consist of a network of sensors and a few control data loggers. It's, again, it's quite essential. Online measurements could be combined and will be combined with airborne drone measurements. AMT could be combined with control source MT in many cases. And of course, we all believe that sometime there will be self burrowing electrodes and induction coils without uh, need to do it manually. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thanks very much, Nick. I, I, I like the self burrowing electrode. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It's an old dream. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'd like to be able to, you know, I, I came into geophysics because I enjoyed being outdoors, but being outdoors, digging holes in the minus 30s. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks very much. So we have a couple of questions on the uh, um, acquisition part. Um, Andreas Junger asked, uh, what was the electrode separation for the comparison, Roger, between your your plates and your pots? Uh, so those are uh, 100 meter dipoles. That's our, our typical uh, dipole size. Uh, we can go down to 50 meter dipoles, um, but if we get too much smaller than that, uh, even running overnight, 
uh, we don't have enough natural field signal on the electrics. So it's uh, 50 to 100 meters. So uh, on the particular comparison, that's 100 meters. Yeah, and then uh, Gabby Matson continued on the question, actually. Great presentation, Saul. <clears throat> Roger, besides in the low frequencies, do you find any scenarios where pots outperform plates? Do plates do well in areas of high contact resistance and capacitive coupling? Um, so uh, the plates do just as well as the pots in the, in the high uh, contact resistance settings. But um, that said, uh, um, Nick Nicolay's uh, comments about high impedance problems are very, very real. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's a difficult problem for us to uh, in terms of low frequencies, uh, the plates are not quite as good as the pots between 100 seconds and 1,000 seconds, uh, but um, but typically it, it's not an important frequency. Uh, but if we do it, if we need to do something for geothermal or for academia, uh, then we'll move back over to pots for uh, for those lowest lowest frequencies. Okay. Um, what about the instrument manufacturers that have yourselves done some acquisition does anybody want to comment about what might be coming in the future based on new styles of equipment in order to you know we really have to if we we're not competing with seismics but we really have to reduce the cost in the field and that means quicker deployment times and roger's and Nick has given us some ideas on those. Um, what we can't get away from is the time we need to record. So this means basically we need a lot. We're, we're often undercapitalized, I feel, on most of our surveys. We need a lot more sensors in the ground. And your, uh, your Titan Cross approach, Rogers, interesting. Uh, I think that's preferable to Titan. Uh, but do any of the instrument manufacturers, do you have comments on acquisition? Well, I guess I have a couple of things. First of all, you know, Roger's right. The, you know, the, the deployment of these things and how many sensors we have on the ground is, is what ends up driving all the cost. Um, so I think to circle back to Max's comment about how, I mean, in a sense, there's a different difference in the economics between the academic groups and, and the service companies. I mean, we have a box in the field 150 days a year. So I think one of the things that as a community we might want to look at is what is the model by which we get instruments into the hands of the academics? If you're going to have a box that's only in the field for 20 days, is that the right thing to do for the community? And therefore, do the, the service companies, of which I am one, you know, do we need to play a slightly different role? Because one of the reasons the academics need the instruments is to train students. And maybe we need to play a role in the training of the students. So it's an academic project, and, but we're using my boxes or Zong's boxes. And we have students helping with the crew. The problem then becomes, how do we get them up to the HSC requirements that are, I mean, I can't reach out and turn off um, the mining company's HSE requirements because this is an academic job. Uh, that doesn't work. So there, maybe there's a different model by which we, as a community, rather than the academics versus the, you know, the industrial guys, how do we as a community go get this data in the box? I think, I think that's a very important point you made there, Scott, is if, we, if we're not training students, if we don't have professors at universities who can afford to buy equipment that can train the students, then the industry suffers. And, oh, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's, there's essentially no, well, certain said, shouldn't say no, there is limited broadband MT groups in, the, in North America now. Yeah. Um, so it's a real challenge for us as a service company to find people that I don't have to start with okay, this is a shovel and this is how you dig a hole. <laughs> um, you know, it's a real challenge. Um, and I don't particularly, you know, that's not economically viable. And so, you know, I'm certainly open to a discussion about 
what do we do together to keep our industry alive? Because, I mean, I think you, I saw one of your emails and there was like 190 people showing up, you know, that had registered for this. My guess is that is a non-trivial portion of the world's MT community. Um, that's yeah. kind of crazy. How do you support something when there's only a couple of hundred of you in the world trying to do it? And then we start fragmenting that into, oh, this is the industrial guys. This is the academic guys. These are the North American guys. These are the Europeans. It's like, and by the time they're, we're done, there's no critical mass. Uh, he would like to say that Northwest is doing a lot of efforts and uh, most of employers actually working in office and in field are uh, students. Uh, students, so a lot of young people are doing that. And uh, Northwest is giving his instrument, commercial instrument, for free to Moscow State University and other institutions in Moscow for training students. This is very important. I completely agree with you. Yeah, I'd like to note that Andy Fraseta is on the line here yeah. in, uh, in the US. Um, uh, Iris Pascal is uh, making an instrument, empty instrument pool available to academics. And so that's that's important progress in this regard. Yeah. Uh, Andy, did, <clears throat> did you want to jump in and, and, and speak? OK. Um, allowed to talk. Sure. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I've I've really enjoyed the discussion so far. Uh, so I appreciate you guys organizing this uh, webinar and the discussion and the speaker. Oh, sorry, sorry, Andrew. Can we? I uh, just uh, introduce you to the rest of the audience. Uh, sure. Yeah, you could introduce yourself. Actually, much better than I could. <laughs> Happy to. Okay. So yeah. Thanks. Um, so. I'm Andy Forsetto. I am the portable program manager for what is now known as the Earthscope Primary Instrument Center. So the Earthscope organization, formerly IRIS, uh, formed from a merger of IRIS and UNAVCO. We're an NSF-funded facility uh, focused mostly on uh, geophysical uh, instrumentation. So we have uh, seismic, geodetic, magnetotelluric instruments that are available for community end users. And uh, we're, we're in the midst of establishing a mixed mode instrument pool of magnetotelluric instruments, some long period, some wide band, that are available for uh, principal investigators that are taking or doing experiments that are funded primarily by the National Science Foundation, but there are other funding agencies with, <clears throat> within the US that support this kind of work. And you know, I'm pleased to see that there's some growing uptake in our community and some growing interest from, I would say, you know, new to MT people uh, that recognize that there's real value in observations that complement uh, other geophysical methods that they might be more familiar with traditionally. So we're in the midst of working with our community to uh, broaden that uptake. And, uh, you know, I'm excited to see where it goes. And I'm excited to see dialogue like this uh, amongst the, the vendors and the community itself. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Andy. Uh, so Alan just wrote in the chat that he has to to leave. So I'm I'm leading the discussion. And certainly, I mean, I'm a user of of both Iris instruments and also uh, the German instrument pools. And certainly to the academics in the audience, I can say that this is a, a viable model. I don't own any in MT instruments, but I have been involved in, an, in a number of surveys. So that's of course, um, sort of goes to um, reducing costs. Yes, if um, instruments are in a pool and I get them for a month and then another investigator gets them for a month, uh, in the same year instead of sitting on a shelf uh, somewhere at a university. Now, let me quickly see if we have more questions. There was one that was uh, asked a little bit earlier uh, by Danu, I don't know how to pronounce it, Danu Bustos. Uh, what you mentioned is the pinch point for MT equipment design today. Hypothetically, what component would benefit the most from a random breakthrough? Does, is there anybody who dares to answer that? 
وانا اميد شي فينلندا وانا اوكي جو اهيد كان I don't know if I don't know if we can talk about a single component as a as a breakthrough uh, in the future of our equipment, but um, coming back to cost, as uh, Roger says, in mining the 10 kilohertz to 10 seconds band is is their band, and uh, they need to reduce cost. So we need to reduce cost in the acquisition of that band. And Roger explained that, well, we need to record overnight to collect this band because the signal is stronger. And no matter what, even if theoretically we can, we could collect this band in 10 or 15 minutes, we still have to record for 12 or 16 hours overnight. By now, today, we have tools to monitor the signal, look at the noise, the theoretical noise floor, and we haven't seen much in our community being done in terms of um, enhancing uh, the data, especially at the high frequencies. Um, so we have seen a few better processing codes there and there, but I think there are still some tools. We, when we're underutilizing um, signal source uh, or, compre or comprehension of the signal source and the noise floor that we get from various instruments. I think these are tools that we should be looking at when we're trying to process our data uh, with the idea and the objective of trying to reduce the operating time to collect high frequencies. So that would be one uh, interesting development that we could see in the future, better processing tool, more adapted to the reality of the field. That, that would be nice. And then when it comes to low frequencies, um, the academic is quite often recording for 10 days, 30 days to get their 20,000 seconds. One mistake, one accident in the field, one broken cable cost tens of thousands of dollars in helicopter access. Knowledge is key. Knowledge of your site, of your instrument is key. So our community, our community needs better access to our data. We need to uh, be constantly of, aware of what's going on in our data, in our time series. We need to have our hands on continuously, remotely and locally. We can't afford by now in 2023 to go back to a site after 30 days and hope for the best. Check the data and restart it. I mean, <laughs> we can't do that anymore. This has this is this was okay before, but now we need to be able to look at our data constantly in real time, whatever it's time series, remotely, locally, and it has to be done easily. And these are those are the type of improvement we can look at if we're considering reducing cost of operation and maybe increasing volume of data collection. Yeah, and just topically on this, there was a talk at the EGU conference, which was last week, yes, uh, by Kanna Saya. Uh, about exactly this, like long period uh, monitoring, and sort of if there's a problem, you can you can see what ha what's happening, uh, and go back and and uh, fix fix your problem before yeah you've recorded two two weeks of nonsense. Um, yes. There is a few more questions or comments. So so uh, Kwame Boy Ado. Um, is talking about sort of, yeah, thanks for being considerate regarding training in academia. Departments in Africa suffer for a lot from practical training due to instrument costs. And then, of course, that's even more compounded than, let's say, the rich um, European universities. Uh, and he's asking if anybody has old instruments uh, to be donated. But yeah, I think, of course, in, in those environments, um, this entry ticket, I forgot who said, who used this coin term, um is is really sort of a, a high barrier um and chris nine has a comment perhaps we need to focus the market a bit mining exploration is very broad considering the number of different critical minerals okay yeah i'm uh, not a hundred percent sure uh, i think mean, that's chris? Yeah, there's different, there's a lot of different environments in mining for sure. <laughs> You've got everything from, you know, the mountaintop to the plains to the solars to very, very conductive 
environments, very, very resistive environments, uh, needing to work in the permafrost. Uh, and so that speaks a lot to, uh, you know, some of the problems with uh, sensor impedance and, and that kind of thing. It's, uh, uh, and also depth of investigation, frequency, bandwidth. There's a, uh, so uh, uh, good comment. Yeah. Um, before we go to the, I think Alan had a sort of last minute lightning round. I would, maybe one thought uh, I wanted to offer that came to me during this discussion regarding cost and, and reliability, having worked with many different instruments, I certainly now value easy to use instruments. Yes, that's, I think is a big thing. Uh, and I think a couple of you mentioned, mentioned that um, because as you said, Jan, uh, a mistake if you have to go repeat a site you know that immediately adds to your deployment cost whether you're an academic or um, uh, an, uh, a commercial provider so I think um, I would like to see you know very simple to use instruments as uh, as much as uh, as, as possible um, because it helps um, getting data collected um hey, all right. Hey. May I yeah, make one yeah, comment? Bennett, yeah. Is one problem in the in the MT is related to the problem that you are measuring noise. Also we constantly, for sure, try to improve our software and um, um, we write new software in auto detection. Most of the parameters, so each electrode can be tested, and you can uh, directly see which electrode is not connected. Yeah, sure. But uh, you're still recording noise um, as long as you don't make uh, CSAMT. And uh, that is a difficult in uh, setting up the instrument. Right? As there is no control whether it works or not. And uh, people making AMT, for example, you will see uh, uh, if you're not measured the contact resistivity of the electrode, you will see a, 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 a pseudo signal in the in the line yeah which is induced in the cable which looks like mt uh, but it doesn't work no? so you have to uh, acquire data because you have noise and then you have to make a short uh, qc that means you make a short interpretation uh, calculating resistivity and phase no? and then it makes it so different like if you have tem you see the signal okay? but you know that there is a source and then you can say, I can see the source. So if I continue to record, it will, it will work. And there will be no way around to make at least a 15 minute measurement in order to get the upper part of the time series, let's say around 100 Hertz and say, this is a reasonable value because even the contact resistivity, in Sweden, you have 10K and here in Northern Germany, we have 300. So it's difficult to predict. So there is no way around. And that is so difficult also for the students. You are measuring noise. And that is if you have the antenna cable from the TV disconnected and you say the TV is working. So it's difficult. It will be difficult, but you can learn it. I mean, many people can learn it. and. Um, I hope that you, as a teacher, uh, 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 get more students uh, and, and uh, teach them how to make MT, and you can borrow instruments from the GFZ, for example. No? Yeah, that's a fantastic yeah, I would like, comment. That's yeah, I completely, yeah, completely to agree because uh, now we're trying to do it as a matter of fact that after installing the instrument, it should run a short test, short quality control to be sure that everything is in order before you left uh, because you leave the instrument for say one day you should be sure that it will be not a rubbish so this yeah. is a kind of uh, matter of fact to do sure yeah. so it also ties together uh, you know the academics and what academia can do uh, in order to know whether you're measuring noise you have to have well trained geophysical understanding people uh, and that's uh, that's absolutely critical to mt uh, the instrument can be as easy as 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 nothing, just one button. But uh, but knowing that you're getting good data is is much more difficult than that. And uh, that's where that's where the academia, you know, that's where we really need people, geophysicists trained um, properly, mm -hmm. uh, to, to be able to recognize that. Fantastic comment. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, okay. Let's do our the the last sort of statements, if you want. So I will. I think the easiest if, if I just call out names. I'll do it in the order that you appear on my screen. 
so let's start with Steve. Any final summarizing remarks? No, not really. I mean, I, I could answer that question in, in, in the chat about the difference between marine loggers and land loggers. I mean, sure. I, as I said, a logger is a logger and I've used mine on land, but there are some important differences. I don't need to go up to 10 kilohertz. So my highest frequencies are limited. I care a lot more about power even those, even when you're lugging lead acid batteries around in the field, I have to lift all my batteries with buoyancy. So power is important. The other thing that people probably don't appreciate is my coils are right next to my logger. So I have to, my logger has to be electromagnetically quiet. You can't even change the clock speed on the CPU without saturating your mags when you do that. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I can't use GPS timing. I have to carry time down with me. So um, there we are, finished. All right. Thank you. Uh, Leo? Ooh. Yeah, Leo? sorry, my, my mic was off. Yeah, uh, one thing Scott said really caught my attention, and that's this idea of critical mass. If you're going to have a company that is uh, doing this wide range of things to, you know, to deliver reliable, rugged, uh, capable instrumentation, you can't do that with two people. You know, there's a certain critical mass of people and different types of expertise and uh, working capital and so on, all of those things, uh, as well as the ongoing business that's required to sustain it. And if you fall below that, then the quality of your offering uh, starts to decrease. So critical mass. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Leo. Roger, any? Uh, uh, sure, Internet of Things, the Internet of Things. I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's one way to solve the monitoring problem. Hopefully, uh, you know, the, all the little satellites will get up there pretty quick and we can, we, can, we can do that. We can watch what's going on. High frequencies, dead band, uh, you know, just reiterating some of the things that we've heard, but uh, that's a very important area to, to focus on for, for development. Yes. And you guys working in, working in academia, train some good geophysicists. We try. <laughs> we'll get you some, hopefully we'll get you some good gear. Yep. Yeah. yeah as a, um, regarding the 32 bit, um, uh, when we come back to that uh, small point, uh, presently, uh, when you look at the, at the numbers, uh, we are digitizing in the range of uh, nanovolts almost. Um, and 90% 90, 90 of the time series, especially in electrodes, is the drift. Right? You have, um, let's say, uh, 100 millivolts drift, and uh, you have peaks of 10 millivolts from some spikes in the electric field, and the true digitized uh, uh, signal, yeah, the carrying uh, signal of the MT, is uh, 0 0.2 millivolts only. No? And uh, for sure, it would be better to have a um, more bits available, which is presently not uh, the case. But even if you would have more uh, bits available, you will see that the drift of the electrodes mostly, as on land-based MT, is is covering 90% uh, of the of the range which you have in your ADC. Right? Also, and if you have 64 bits, it will not be much better because. When you look at the small number which you digitize, if you have 32 bits and let's say you have uh, five, milli, uh, five volts uh, input range, yeah, it is so small that you are in the range of the digitizing the noise of the instrument itself. So the electrode has a noise, the coil has a noise, the amplifier has a noise. So um, yeah, if you can reduce the electrode drift, you will be slightly better. But it will not be a jump if you said, say, a 48 bit uh, digitizer would be available. Uh, like uh, Steve, uh, Steve mentioned it earlier, I think, I, I doubt that you will see any difference. Yeah. yeah. So, mostly the most bits we are using for getting the sit system not saturated. No? If you have a, a spike in a time series, your analog digital converter will have a ringing. There will be a small effect afterwards. Then no? this is quite high price, so you you get the range and use most of the bits not to get the system overpowered at any time, including the long drift of the electric field, and that consumes most of the bits of the the, the time series. No? 
But 32-bit makes it possible to get a conservative setting. Mm. And uh, in the old days, we used uh, some, let's say, gain switching in order to correct uh, or offset compensation. And with 32-bit, this is not necessary anymore. You can make a constant recording and say, it will be covered. No? Okay, yeah, that's, that's an interesting point, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, Nick? Uh, actually, not so much to say. There's everything was said and mentioned, but uh, from the point of view of service company, uh, I would like to say that uh, we all, as a customer for instrumentation, also the instrument production, uh, should prepare for, for changes, for changes. And I do not see actually uh, uh, some uh, ideas how we could change in future, because I'm afraid that uh, changes could be very fast. I mean, coming to some, uh, when the era of uh, hydrocarbon will finish, we should be ready for that. I do not see at the moment that we are ready. Yeah. I think it depends. I don't know. It's probably Max, a different. You don't, uh, Max, you don't, the block. you don't forgot us, Mark. Max? No, 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 no. Just I want to give a quick answer. I didn't forget you, Valerie. Um, just um, I think in the academic game, it looks a bit different because geothermal and minerals are playing a big role there. Sorry. Now over to Lviv and Scott. I think should also be able to to say something before we uh, close, and maybe Lindsay has some some final thoughts. Uh, so, Valerie or Vera. When preparing to this uh, uh, seminar, we were absolutely sure that people will be more interested in parameters of instrument instrumentation. But what's, uh, here we had that mostly economic questions are prevalent. And uh, even I heard very important phrase that uh, cost of instrumentation is only entrance ticket in magnetotellurics. So from this, I see that all our attempts, all the 30 years of our existence to produce uh, one of the best instrumentation or even sometimes the best instrumentation were also uh, directed on the same uh, goal to decrease the price. Now I see that it was wrong way. We shall not in increase the price, but if you need really something really super sensitive, super low drift, super wide, please come to us. We continue our scientific <laughs> research, and I understand that we mostly serve by uh, university to universities and uh, scientific companies, but sometimes uh, for professional uh, researcher can also use some of our achievement. Thank you. Yeah, well, really. This is only for commercial, not for not for academy. <laughs> well, and I would say uh, probably to to some degree uh, we now have or re only recently have reached a point where that becomes less of a concern. Yes, I think uh, a few years ago that discussion might have looked uh, a bit different. Yes, um, so certainly those efforts are still appreciated. Okay, Scott. Um, to circle back to the. You know the the community here and the critical mass we've got the critical mass on this call right now i think all of the instrument manufacturers if you have a really great idea and you think that this is something we should be working on pick one of us and give us a call we'll certainly talk to you about it um if we can make a if we can make a business case that it's a good idea then we're more than happy to move these things forward it's you know zong you know leo was talking about the critical mass to keep a manufacturing company going i got the critical mass of keeping a manufacturing company and a field service company going and even with that there's only 50 of us um you know we're these are not big organizations so the 200 people that are online right now have a lot of good ideas and if you have one that we should be playing with please Please reach out to one of us and, and we'll see if we can make it go. Yeah, and then maybe the final words to Lindsay, who has been on this call sort of quietly with uh, <laughs> sort of certainly might have some ideas as well. Sure, well, just wanna first of all, say thank you to everyone. I really appreciated this conversation um, and especially I look forward to following up on conversations about how we can connect with students and uh, interact as academics um, with you all. Cause it's certainly a, a gap, you know, at UBC, we don't have much in terms of instrumentation and being mostly on the software side, there's so much value in connecting with folks who are actually deploying these stations and seeing where data comes from. So I'll look forward to hopefully following up with many of you after this. 
Yeah, all right. With that, I'd like to thank everyone for the discussion. I found it uh, very interesting and certainly some, some new perspectives. Um, and with that, I'd like to close the Amina for this week. I have to admit, I forgot already who is speaking next week. Lindsay, do you remember? Otherwise, I'll have a... I believe it was Hannah. Oh, yes, that's right. Hannah P. is a case study comparison of airborne EM data over two magmatic nickel deposits. So um, a bit different from today, but certainly just as interesting. So thanks, everyone, and have a good day, and hopefully see you again. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you, bye. Bye. bye.